Hello everybody and welcome to PMDD and Me Meet the Professionals, our series of webinars sponsored by Asarina Pharma, where we empower you to become the expert and advocate of your own reproductive health through education. My name is Alice Gerling. I'm a specialist reproductive health midwife, registered teacher, and Fellow of the Higher Education Academy. I also have my own lived experience of premenstrual dysphoric disorder, which I suffered with for over 20 years before being diagnosed. Unfortunately, my PMDD was treatment resistant, and four years ago, I took the difficult decision to undertake the last resort option and have a total hysterectomy and bilateral oophorectomy. PMDD and Me is a community interest company, which I co-founded with my wife, Sarah. We are a regulated, not-for-profit organisation and work to facilitate the highest quality of evidence-based education and wellbeing support to those experiencing menstrual disorders to enable self-advocacy and self-empowerment. Now, despite being a reproductive health specialist, I was very underprepared for my transition into surgical menopause. Naively, I thought that managing my menopause would be a breeze compared to PMDD, but I underestimated what a complete shock to the system it would be. Um, and having a condition such as PMDD, where I had an acute sensitivity to hormones, meant that balancing my add back HRT was a very delicate process. I also discovered that to achieve complete well-being, I needed to work very hard at my mental health to find my new normal. Today, we welcome Dr. Hannah Short to our programme. Hannah is an expert GP who specialises in menopause and premenstrual disorders. She is recognised by the British Menopause Society, the International Association for Premenstrual Disorders, and the National Association for Premenstrual Syndrome. In 2018, Hannah was awarded an advanced certificate in menopause care, which meant she could receive referrals uh, for a menopause service for both NHS as well as private patients. Now she has written for numerous medical journals, is currently on the executive committee for the Primary Care Women's Health Forum and is a member of the IAPMD Surgical Menopause Advisory Clinic uh, Committee. Sorry. Um, she uh, Hannah also works extensively within the voluntary sector for the DAISY Network. Now that is a UK based charity working with those experiencing premature ovarian insufficiency due to medical or surgical reasons. She's also got a personal interest in the role of plant based nutrition in health, disease and oestrogen metabolism. 
but today Hannah is going to be talking to us about PMDD, giving us an overview of the condition and the treatment pathway and focusing on the uh, aspect of menopause relating to premenstrual disorders. So before I hand over to Hannah, I'd just like to uh, draw your attention to the chat function. Please feel free to talk to other participants using this during Hannah's presentation. Um, but if you could use the Q&A function, so the question and answer function to ask your questions during Hannah's presentation, then I will be able to go through as many of those as possible with Hannah following her presentation. You can also upvote anybody else's questions uh, if you find them particularly interesting. So without further ado, I would like to um, invite Hannah to join us. Hannah, are you there? Hello, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hi Hannah, how are you today? I'm fine, thank you. How are you? Very well. Oh, we're matching colours. We are. <laughs> Great. I'm just going to work out how to share my screen here. So, oh no, I can't do that. It says it's disabled, um, the sheet screen sharing. Ah. Okay. Okay. If I can do that. Yeah, bear with me. Right. Does that work now? Yeah, looks like it should work. Okay. I'll just get this up. And right. Yes, we're ready. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for the introduction, Alice, and um, thank you to everyone joining us today. Um, I think most people joining us are those who are affected by um, PMDD, but I think there may be a couple of professionals as well. Um, for the most part, this presentation and um, discussion is, is really for patients who are affected by it, but hopefully it will be useful to those who are also caring for, for women who are affected with premenstrual disorders um, and struggling with, with menopause, um, either as a result or alongside it. So um, Alice has kind of given an introduction um, and so you know a bit about my professional background from a personal point of view. Um, like Alice, I also have a personal history of uh, severe premenstrual disorder and I suspect if I was diagnosed today it would have been classed as PMDD, um, but it's just that it was down as a severe premenstrual disorder because um, this is in 2013 and much like um, Alice, my, my condition was treatment resistant and as a result of that I ended up having a hysterectomy and removal of both my ovaries um, at the age of 35. Um, and that was a big shock to the system. Um, I also had endometriosis and was in pain every day. And so that was another reason for the surgery. And much like Alice, I think I believed that um, this, you know, I just needed some add back HRT and I could just go merrily on my way. Um, um, and I was sorely mistaken. Um, quality of life is definitely a lot better, but there's certainly challenges in menopause and especially surgical menopause um, if you have a history of premenstrual disorders. And that's what we're going to talk about. Um, and this is uh, because of my own experience, that's how I ended up working in this area. Um, Anyway, right, so let's get started. I'm gonna, this will only be a brief overview, unfortunately, because they're ben, both menopause and PMDD are such enormous topics. You could probably have a day on both. Um, so we'll do what we can. There will be um, a, quite a chance for question and answers. And um, Alice put some of my contact details. So on social media, I'm at Dr. Hannah um, Short, um, and they've got a website at drhannahshort.co.uk, and you can send me a message via the form there as well. Um, also, I haven't listed all the references because it would clutter the slides, but if anybody needs any specific references or is interested, please let me know. Okay, just declaration of interest. Um, okay, so just a quick overview of what we mean by premenstrual disorders. So premenstrual syndrome, a lot of us will have heard um, of PMS and it's a term that's banded around for, um, a lot. Um, a lot of people don't necessarily understand fully what it means. Some people even question whether it really exists, but it certainly does exist. It's um, a spectrum of physical and mood related symptoms present in the luteal phase of the menstrual cycle. So that's the second part of the, um, of the menstrual cycle following ovulation, usually around two weeks before. And the period starts. 
Well, around 80% of women are thought to have noticed some physiological change um, in, in, their, in their health or their well-being in the lead up to their period. But for not every woman, it's, it's, it's not necessarily a problem. It may even be that they just notice some physiological shift, which means they notice there's a difference, say, in their um, cervical discharge. Um, or maybe they just they, they notice they're sleeping a little bit differently or they might have a mild headache. Um, but it's not enough really to impact them in any significant way. However, around 30% of women and those assigned female at birth, so this includes like trans men, um, may well notice um, that, the, that the symptoms before their period are problematic and is having a little an impact on their on their daily lives. But they may well be able to manage um, the, this with you know lifestyle changes or just even recognizing it for what it is and, and planning things. But it wouldn't be enough to necessarily affect their working life or their social life or their relationships. Okay, premenstrual dysoric disorder, on the other hand, is a much more severe form of PMS. Um, and it's thought to um, affect up to five to eight percent of women. Um, we don't have exact numbers, but the, the studies so far suggest that this, this is it's in this ballpark. Um, unlike women with um, a clinical PMS, these women um, are so severely affected, it does affect their quality of life and they may not be able to attend school, college, work, or it may wreak havoc on their relationships um, or their ability to work or hold down a job. Um, the, there's, there's several ways to diagnose premenstrual dysphoric disorder and it depends by which um, what we're going for. So um, the American Psychiatric Association, for example, has very strict criteria. Um, in, the, in the UK, you can be said to have a core premenstrual dysphoric disorder, which they will otherwise known as PMDD. And actually, it's just more the severity that, that um, it marks it out as, as a severe disorder there. But the, the main thing we need to consider in, in, in a diagnosis of PMDD is that it, there's a severe, um, a severe impact on quality of life. There will always be a psychological or psychiatric component in the symptoms, um, and it tends to resolve as, as soon as the, the period arrives or shortly afterwards. Um, then there's also premenstrual exacerbation, and this is, there can be a little bit of diagnostic uncertainty. So sometimes people are diagnosed with PMDD or severe PMS, and it might be PME. PME is premenstrual exacerbation, and this is where there's an underlying disorder. It can be physical, so epilepsy, migraine, asthma, or a psychiatric disorder, so depression, obsessive compulsive disorder, anxiety, um, bipolar disorder, and this can worsen in, in the weeks we're leading up to the period too. And with PME, the treatment really should be focused on the um, an underlying condition rather than on, on, on the hormonal element. Of course, the two can coexist, and that's, that's where there can be some problems. But um, it, it, the way to differentiate these things is to kind of track your symptoms. Okay, this is a very brief overview of, of premenstrual disorder, disorder and showing how complex this, this um, condition is. There's no one thing which caused it, and it's an area where there's a lot of research lacking, unfortunately. Um, this is a little infographic, um, actually from a, um, a psychiatric um, um, a, a, a part of the hospital in, in the US. In the US. Um, so I'll put the link down there for it. But it's 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 a very good article, and it was actually this this article was published in a in a psychiatric journal in 2017, and they found there were five main components contributing to PMDD. So we know that women with a severe premenstrual dysphoric disorder. Um, there tends to be a genetic component there. Um, we see that there's heritability within families. So it doesn't necessarily mean that if, say, your mother had PMDD or you have PMDD, that somebody else in your family or your daughter would necessarily develop it. But there does seem to be a link. Um, so we've seen that from various studies. Um, we believe that there's genetic um, problems within certain um, genes relating to estrogen metabolism and serotonin metabolism. So serotonin is a neurotransmitter in the brain and obviously heavily influences mood. There's also a large number of women with PMDD um, have an abnormal response to progesterone or more specifically we think to the metabolites to so a breakdown product of progesterone called allopregnanolone. So in women who don't have PMDD or a progesterone intolerance, um, the allopregnanolone um, impacts um, or affects receptors in the brain known as GABA receptors. And this causes a kind of a calming response. 
In women with PMDD, it often causes the opposite response. So it can induce things like rage or severe anxiety or suicidal depression. Um, and this is not what we would normally expect because I say in lots of people, progesterone can be quite calming. And in women I see with normal menopause, in menopause, but with no history of progesterone intolerance, it can be quite helpful if there are troubles with sleep or trouble with anxiety, which can just arise in women without any history of premenstrual disorder in the, in the perimenopausal years. However, it's not quite as simple in PMDD as women just not being able to tolerate progesterone. So there's different forms of progesterone. There's the progesterone that we naturally produce following ovulation. Um, and um, there's, there's also progestogens, which are in, the, um, in things like contraception and HRT. And sometimes women are unable to kind of tolerate or they can, they, they can have PMDD type symptoms with the synthetic progestogens in contraception and HRT, but they might well be okay with their own progesterone. There's also some other studies which suggest that the progesterone um, um, metabolite, al allopragnolone, is at low levels in women, um, ironically, with PMDD. And so some women actually feel better when they're given um, a standard, a steady dose of, of, of natural progesterone, which is called utrogestan in the UK, and can be given as part of HRT. Um, and it's more the fluctuating levels or the low levels that are causing problems. So I think even within the PMDD population, there's great variation as to who's going to respond um, well or, um, or negatively to progesterone. And we still need to know a lot more about that. There's interconnections between estrogen, serotonin and something called BDNF, which is brain derived neurotrophic factor. BDNF is a neurotransmitter in the brain and it's also cyclical. So it, it, it seems to be affected by estrogen um, and, and it changes across the cycle. And we think that this, this part of the puzzle may be why the SSRI um, group of antidepressants can sometimes work well for women with PMDD and can often have a response in days. It, it may well inf influence this, this relationship there. And we think it may impact the GABA receptors in the brain and how they react to progesterone. Um, I suppose there's one thing that's really important to talk about in PMDD and menopause is that um, there's a lot of stuff on social media saying women are being given SSRI antidepressants wrongly when they should be given HRT in menopause. The thing is, it's not that black and white, especially in women with PMDD, because sometimes they may well need um, an SSRI to help stabilise things and help them get the best from their HRT. It's not either or. So I sometimes think these black and white statements on, on social media aren't hugely helpful. Um, then just coming on to the other components, there's, there certainly seems to be a link with trauma in women um, who have a diagnosis of PMDD. You seem to, you're more likely to be diagnosed with PMDD if you've experienced trauma. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to have done. Um, and it's not saying this is a, psycho a purely psychological condition, but more that it might just affect the, the stress pathways and how your body responds to stress, which may make you more likely to develop PMDD if you have if you have the genetic susceptibility. Um, there seems to be an altered response to cortisol, which is a stress hormone in women with PMDD and high levels of inflammatory markers, um, which is also something we see in menopause. And this is because estrogen can affect the immune system. And as estrogen levels fluctuate in perimenopause and throughout the cycle, that can influence levels of inflammation in the body too. Lastly, um, there seems to be a difference in brain structure and function in women with PMDD. And a part of the brain called the amygdala, which plays a large role in emotion and fear and things like that, um, it seems to, seems to be different in women. We don't know whether that's a cause or effect of the condition. Okay, so there's a lot kind of going on there, and that's just a real quick whiz through, but just shows you how complex it is. Okay, so just some menopause terminology quickly, because this can get confusing. Menopause is actually a term which just refers to a single point in a woman's life, and that's one year following the final menstrual period. Um, often some women will not know when that is, um, it, but the average age in the UK is 51 years of age. Okay, perimenopause is the lead up to the final period. And this is when we talk about menopausal symptoms, often we're talking about perimenopausal symptoms. And it's when the levels of estrogen and progesterone are fluctuating all over the place. Um, and they're, they're what 
causing these menopausal symptoms to arise. And this is what can lead to exacerbation of PMDD symptoms as well. Perimenopause can, contrary to popular belief, actually start up to 10 years before your final period. So although, say, say the average age of menopause in the UK is one, sorry, 51, um, um, it, any age over 45 can be normal, but you could well be starting perimenopausal symptoms in your early 40s or even before. Postmenopause is just the time following menopause. So after you've gone 12 months without a menstrual period, you're then in postmenopausal. Unless, of course, you're in induced menopause. So induced menopause is the term for a medical or a surgical menopause. So a medical menopause can come about if we give you medications to switch off your ovarian function. So this can happen if you're having treatment for endometriosis or in fact PMDD to see if your symptoms get better without the menstrual cycle. It can also happen as a result of things like chemotherapy or radiotherapy and cancer. In those cases, it's often temporary, but occasionally, especially in terms of cancer treatment, it can be permanent. Surgical menopause is removal of the ovaries, um, and that is always permanent. I hear people talk a lot about hysterectomy for PMDD, but a hysterectomy itself does not put you into menopause. It's the removal of the ovaries that causes the, the menopause. If you have your hysterectomy removed, um, sorry, if you have a hysterectomy and your ovaries are left in, you're still going to get a cycle and it will not be treating PMDD. So I think that's important that people are aware of that. Um, it can help if there is a big um, component of progesterone intolerance, but it's often not enough if, if the treatment has otherwise been severe enough, sorry, the condition has been severe enough to, to warrant surgery. Okay. And then early menopause and premature ovarian insufficiency. If your last period is um, below, the, below the age of 45, then you're said to have had an early menopause. Um, if it's below the age of 40, um, you're said to have had a premature menopause or be in premature ovarian insufficiency. Okay, so that's our terminology. Now, this is just a graph that I show patients in clinics sometimes just to show what happens to our estrogen levels throughout life. Obviously, it's just a very brief, basic overview, but you can see that estrogen levels ramp up over puberty, then they're kind of up and down throughout our reproductive life. Um, obviously, it's not even showing the kind of monthly cycles, but they can fluctuate, obviously, again, relating to whether there's pregnancies and things like that as well, and changes in contraception. And then things go a little bit haywire in perimenopause. And if we consider PMDD as an abnormal response to normal hormonal fluctuations, um, you're, you can understand why everything can get a lot worse for women with PMDD if they enter perimenopause naturally, because you no longer have that kind, um, kind of predictable pattern of the worsening of symptoms in the two weeks before menopause. You may, you know, you may go months without a period, um, but it can feel like you're about to get a period as, as your body's attempting to ovulate, but maybe isn't, isn't producing enough estrogen to do that. Um, and they just go all over, over the place. And it's those extra um, symptoms of the hormones going everywhere that, that's kind of worsening things for you. And, you know, these fluctuations are what cause the perimenopausal symptoms in women without PMDD. Um, so if you're adding that into the mix, that can actually make it a lot worse as well. However, there is a subset, again, the women um, who are slightly progesterone intolerant can sometimes find that they, their symptoms can improve a little bit in perimenopause. So if they're not hugely um, susceptible to some of the estrogen changes, if they're not ovulating and they're not producing adequate progesterone, which is only produced once you have ovulated, um, if, they're, if they're having lower levels of progesterone, some people can actually feel better during that, that time. So again, it's, it's certainly um, not, not a case of one case fits all, one size fits all. This is a very brief look at the um, premenstrual disorder guidelines published by the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists. So this is available for anybody to download. Um, and I often recommend that people take it to their GPs. Um, I think a lot of GPs aren't aware of the existence of these guidelines. Um, but they are based on the best available evidence. And this was last updated in 2017. So, I mean, this is um, looking at all forms of premenstrual disorder, including PME and a milder PMS. And as with all medical treatments, you start looking at, you know, the least invasive um, treatments. So things like lifestyle changes can be beneficial. 
um, and sometimes cognitive behavioural therapy, because um, I think if you have a milder form of PMS, just recognising that's what it is can sometimes be quite helpful and you can plan and prepare for it. In younger women, the pill can be helpful because it can switch off your, you know, your ovulation and give you hormonal stability. And that's what you need if you've got a premenstrual disorder. Um, but again, if you're intolerant to progestogens, that can be problematic. You'll see here in the first line um, of recommendations for treatments that SSRIs can be very helpful, um, either just given in the two weeks before your period or taken continuously. Um, and this is not, we're not trying to treat this as a clinical depression. As if you think back to that um, little infographic I showed you earlier, it's because of the impact that the, um, the SSRI seem to have on the brain and possibly the, the stabilization of, of the interactions between the estrogen and the, and the serotonin and the BDNF and, and possibly the GABA receptors. That's why if you're recommended that, it's not that you're necessarily being fobbed off, but there's, there is medical reason for that. Um, however, if these don't help, some, we, some women will be offered estrogen therapy and either natural progesterone or something like the marina coil, which tend to be the, the progesterone forms that are best tolerated by women with PM, PMS or PMDD. Um, again, the marina coil can often be a good one because it's a low dose of a progesterone and um, it, it's just, it works locally in, in, the, in the lining of the womb, but it does give you the protection that you need from the estrogen. So women who have who've still got a womb definitely need progesterone if they're having estrogen. Otherwise, you get a buildup of the lining of the womb. And there can be um, problematic cell changes that, if left untreated, could lead to um, endometrial cancer. So that's why we cannot just give women estrogen without having progesterone. Otherwise, that would be a nice, a nice way to treat a lot of women. Um, and it's one of the main reasons that women do end up having surgery for PMDD in difficult cases. So this is a treatment that can be given to women who aren't peri, um, perimenopausal. Um, and it's, we think it works in two ways. Um, it, one, it's stable, like it tops up your levels. So it's some women, estrogen it, um, is, it really, really influences their mood. And so having a higher level overall um, can help. And otherwise, um, it, it also, it kind of down regulates that feedback from the brain. So as long as your brain realizes that you actually have um, a higher dose of estrogen than normal, it doesn't kind of try and generate your, your ovaries to produce more and more estrogen. So it calms down those fluctuations. So that's how that can work there. It can also work obviously really well in perimenopause if there are lots of menopausal symptoms as well as, well as PMDD symptoms. Then we get onto third line, which is where you may be offered something like a GnRH analog. Um, these are medications to essentially switch off the ovarian cycle, um, and then you're given um, add back HRT because it's very important if this happens below the age of 45 that you have that for your health. And we'll come on to why that is. GnRH analogs are often only given if you're considered to be a potential candidate for for surgery, and if nothing else has really helped so far. And the last line is the surgical treatment, um, and that's removal of the ovaries um, with or without the, the, the womb and giving you back HRT. So the, the aim of anything really when we're trying to talk about a premenstrual disorder is to provide a, um, a hormonal stability because it's the fluctuating levels that are, that are problematic. Okay. This is just a, the small bit um, um, that's in that document, which is quite a large document about, about surgery for PMS and for PMDD and saying that there is benefits that has been shown for women with severe PMS, that having a hysterectomy and removal of both ovaries can help. However, this is only considered when medical management has failed. So you'd need to work through all of those steps before give, you know, considering that. Um, I do sometimes see people who say they just want a hysterectomy, don't want to go through that. But having personally been through surgery as well, and having seen a lot of patients who've had surgery as well, it's not something you want to go through unless it's absolutely essential. A surgical menopause is, is not an easy thing to deal with. Um, and it's not a cure for hormone sensitivity, which is something we will talk about. It just takes away the main driver for the PMDD. I'm just going to talk a little bit now about menopause independent of PMDD. And this is a poster that I produced with a nursing friend who also underwent an early surgical menopause for PMDD. And both of us were in the medical profession. Both of us realized that not enough was um, done to, to kind of support women in the menopause. 
And when you stop and think about it, it's incredibly surprising, but, um, or maybe it's not surprising, but it's disappointing and frustrating because 51% of the population um, will go through menopause if they're lucky enough to live long enough. And at any one point in time, there's one in three women um, who, are, who are struggling with perimenopausal menopausal symptoms. We'll say that um, around 80% of women will notice some changes around their menopause. Not everybody will struggle. Um, and again, this is, this is women in the general population, not the PMDD population. But a quarter of women generally will say the menopause symptoms affect their quality of life. And I often hear people say, oh, well, you know, you just have to get through it. But that's not the case for every woman. So some women, they will have problematic symptoms ongoing. Um, there are women in their 80s who still struggle with hot flushes. This probably affects around, say, 10% of women. And obviously, if you have a surgical menopause, you may always have menopausal symptoms. You've had part of your endocrine system removed. Um, it's not the same as natural menopause. And that's a message that really needs to get out there. OK. The number of women who are entering an early menopause or premature menopause is rising every year and that's partly due to the increase in surgeries for things like endometriosis, PMDD, for women who have um, a BRCA gene so make them at higher risk of breast cancer or ovarian cancer and women who have survived um, cancer treatment um, and their treatment has, has put them into a premature menopause. And it's something we need to take seriously, not just from a quality of life point of view, but a long term health point of view. So the risk of heart disease goes up after natural menopause as it is, but it doubles um, if, if you go into an early menopause. Um, women who are in menopause, whether it's an early or natural menopause, have an, a double the risk of um, having, having osteoporosis. And yet there's a lot of confusion about treatments. What can we do about menopause? Um, in fact, three out of four women, this Bear in mind, we did this in 2015, I think, and um, say so they do not know enough um, about HRT to make an informed choice. And unfortunately, I think that's the, that applies to a lot of medics as well, because we don't have adequate training in this. So it's something hope we're trying to change. So when we're coming on to menopausal symptoms, and again, this isn't um, particular to PMDD, um, it's, it, it's, this, this can affect women who you don't have any history of premenstrual uh, um, syndrome. Um, menopausal symptoms can affect every part of the body because you have estrogen um, um, receptors everywhere. The one most people have heard about, obviously, are the hot flushes, but they don't necessarily affect every woman. Around 80% will get um, hot flushes, but that can vary from feeling a little bit warm to having debilitating hot flushes and sweats um, day and night. Um, night sweats are very common. But mood changes are incredibly common, and that's not even within the PMDD population. And they're often most commonly start in perimenopause and often before women will get any hot flushes. So this um, picture here is, is a picture of a poster that was developed by the West Midlands Police. after they did an awareness raising campaign and they actually put this on the back of the toilets in both the men and the women's loos, which I think is fantastic, just to show that, that these, these symptoms um, are, may well be affecting a large proportion of people in the police force, therefore may be having an effect on their ability to, to work. Um, and this isn't to say that they therefore shouldn't be doing that work, but they need to be supported and facilitated and being able to manage their work and get the right information that they need so they're able to do that and live well and healthily. Um, I haven't really got time to go into this in detail, but essentially, um, as I said, it can affect any part of your any part of a woman's body. Joint pain is incredibly common. Gastric symptoms can be common. Headaches, vaginal dryness, bladder symptoms, a whole host of things. The most effective medical treatment for menopausal symptoms um, does remain HRT, but there's a lot of myths around HRT again. Um, Again, not enough time to go into this, but essentially um, HRT is safe and effective for the vast majority of women who start menopause um, below the age of 60 and when, you know, or sorry, start HRT below the age of 60 and within 10 years of menopause. Um, we, we, we know that from the studies. So there were some studies in the early 2000s where it threw some doubt on the safety, but um, further studies have been done. That old study has been re-evaluated. And I think most of us can now say with confidence that, that the benefits certainly outweigh the risks. And this is set, it's definitely the case in women with an early or premature menopause and with a surgical menopause. 
um, and especially if you're taking oestrogen only, which is often the case if you've had a surgical menopause with a hysterectomy, because it's um, a lot of women will worry about the breast cancer risk, but that's more to do with the combination of oestrogen and progesterone. Um, there's very little, if, if, if any, risk um, of, of breast cancer with oestrogen only HRT, and no risks that are attributable to HRT um, come into effect until you reach the age of natural menopause anyway, which is why it's so important for women to take HRT if they are able. I appreciate there's a small group of women who are unable to do this, possibly because they've had an estrogen dependent cancer, for example. Um, but if you are able to, just for quality of life, but also for protecting your long term health. Um, obviously, not every woman will need HRT, um, you know, who, if, once you're over 45, but, but um, I'm assuming a lot of the women that, that are listening now um, and lots of women we will see in practice will do if they're struggling with their symptoms. Um, obviously, lifestyle, diet, things like that make a huge difference, but they're not always enough. Um, this is just a slide um, that we picked up from a conference um, I went to last year looking at menopausal health. Um, and about long-term health with estrogen deficiency. So I hope they don't mind that I've uh, shared it here because I just wanted to demonstrate um, the impact of long-term health on estrogen deficiency. So if you look at here, this, this is the result um, of a poll that was done looking at the perceived causes of death by women. And as you can see 39% of women concerned that, they, that breast cancer is the leading cause of death, whereas actually it's only around 4% of women. The biggest risk to women is heart disease. Um, and this risk hugely increases um, as we, as we um, enter menopause, and especially so if you have an early menopause, so below the age of 45. And there's a lot that we can do about that. We know that HRT re hugely reduces that risk if you start at that below the age, um, if, you, if you have an early menopause. And that's one reason why we do encourage women to use it. Also helps your bone health, brain health, um, likely to reduce the risk of Alzheimer's, especially if you have a menopause below the age of 45. Um, reducing the risk of diabetes and potentially even colorectal cancer. I'm not saying HRT is a cure-all, I'm just concerned that it's, um, it's often maligned um, and people focus on potential breast cancer risk, whereas we need to look at really what is killing women and looking at quality of life. Um, so menopause and PMDD. Um, I've already spoken a little bit about that. You can see why it, what might well worsen in the perimenopause. Um, and this looking specifically at HRT, as I've just said, HRT is recommended until at least the age of natural menopause. Um, so this would be in anybody with an early menopause, but certainly in those who've undergone a surgical menopause for long-term health as well as symptom control. However, there's no magic answer for what's the correct HRT and it really needs to be tailored to the individual. So, when women with a natural menopause who haven't had surgery, um, you will require a progesterone. And as I said, some people are intolerant to progesterones or synthetic progestogens, but that's not necessarily the case for everybody. So don't assume if you've, had, if you've not got on well with the pill or the marina that you can't say get on with natural progesterone. It may be that you actually can tolerate it quite well or it may even be beneficial to you. Um, but um, it, it's not needed medically in surgical menopause. So if you've had your ovaries removed, you do not need to have um, a progesterone. There's no safety issue there. Some women feel better if you add it back in, but that has to be a decision that's um, after careful discussion with your doctor, um, because the, there's a, the increased risk of breast cancer is greater with the combined um, HRT than it is just with estrogen only. But again, that's just a small part of the picture. And if it's, if it's helpful in terms of anxiety, in terms of sleep, then it, it may be beneficial. But so this is just to say it needs to be tolerated to the individual. But a lot of women with, with PMDD and those who have had this, gone down the surgical menopause route will not need progesterone, will just need the oestrogen. But women who are younger than um, natural menopausal age will often need higher doses to feel well. However, there are those women who struggle um, with oestrogen um, and they, they can find that confusing because a lot of the menopausal symptoms are due to oestrogen deficiency. Often the problem is adjusting to new levels, um, and, but sometimes the problem with oestrogen can be related to a histamine intolerance. I mean, this is another vast subject, and again, it's vastly under-researched, but histamine is a chemical we naturally produce, but we also ingest it in our foods and stuff. Um, it's, it, it's related to the immune response, and it's also impacted by hormonal change. 
when estrogen levels rise, so does histamine. Um, a histamine often produces um, allergy type reactions. And so if you're somebody who's struggling, um, I don't know, with, with itchiness or I, I sometimes, sometimes migraines, um, problems like that, sometimes women can develop sort of wheezing and stuff in, in natural menopause as well. That can be to do with a kind of histamine intolerance. This does require a kind of a can, if it's bad, it can require special kind of um, input, um, but sometimes just taking antihistamines um, or, or kind of building up estrogen very, very slowly, that, that can kind of reduce that effect that you get um, with the histamine thing. The other thing is looking at your diet. So alcohol and dairy are two things that are real no-no if you have histamine intolerance because they hugely increase the histamine that you, you produce. Um, and sometimes it's, it, your body's not able to naturally kind of excrete the, the histamine as well. Um, so it's, it's far too big a subject really to go into here, but it's just to say, if you feel that you can't tolerate any HRT, it's, it's unlikely to be fully the case. There's likely to be something you can do, okay? Um, and I'm just saying with, with anybody with a history of premenstrual disorder, it's just important to know that it, it can take at least a month to adjust to any HRT changes and you may feel worse before you feel better. And this seems incredibly unfair, but unfortunately it is just the way it is. Um, and small changes should be made slowly um, to assess full effect. It's really tempting, especially if you feel rotten to say after two weeks, I just can't do this. But some, uh, it, it's just, I think, uh, documenting symptoms and stuff again and just seeing it. Sometimes if you, if you are able to persist, things can get a little bit better. OK. So it's just to say menopause here is not a cure for hormone sensitivity. Women who have a surgical menopause, it's taking away the main driver of PMDD. So those cyclical hormonal changes, but it doesn't cure the underlying hormonal sensitivity and surgical menopause is permanent. Both need to be managed as chronic conditions. And this is something I, I've had to learn myself. You have to accept that, unfortunately. I think I naively thought, okay, I'll have my ovaries out, have some add back HRT and I'll go on my way. Unfortunately, that's not been the case. I mean, I've had difficulties with absorbing estrogen and various other things, but obviously this isn't to do with me, but this is a picture I see just across the board we're not going to suddenly become women who are not hormonally sensitive. That unfortunately is the case. There are things we can do to manage it, but we're not suddenly going to be um, those women that you might hear about on forums or on the TV who say, oh, I took HRT and yeah, my life's brilliant now. It doesn't really work like that when you have a hormone sensitivity, but there is, there is hope. <laughs> and so what can you do moving forward? Um, Alice uh, mentioned this, psychological work is, is absolutely paramount. Um, and this is coming from a lot of different um, sides, really. One, there's the acceptance that I've just mentioned. Two, a lot of women feel they have to mourn their, the loss. So especially in younger women who were not able to have children. So I obviously lost the ability to have children. Um, and I would don't feel I was ever in a position really to consider that because I never felt well enough. But it's, it, it's something that's hit me since. I think you can mourn those years where you, um, that you kind of unlived because you're, 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 you know, so much of your life has been impacted by the hormonal changes and you haven't been able to live what you would consider a normal life um, and youth. Because I think, unfortunately, a lot of people consider that, you know, premenopausal is young and postmenopausal is old. Clearly, it's not that black and white. Um, and there's some issues within society, which we won't get into. But I think it's normal to have these reactions around menopause, especially if it's an early in a surgical menopause. And there's one thing that we see, um, which I think throws a lot of women, is the ongoing cyclical symptoms. So a lot of women will still feel like they're having PMDD type symptoms on a cyclical basis, even when they've had their ovaries removed um, or in natural menopause. So in terms of natural menopause, that can be explained um, in that sometimes you're just you are having some kind of cycle, but it's just not enough to ovulate or to have any bleeds. Um, and that tend, may well tend to settle. In women with this, um, a surgical menopause, it's because the brain is kind of basically expecting that. There's a neuroplasticity of the brain is where we kind of strengthen neural pathways um, until things become just so unconscious and automatic. 
we're cyclical creatures by nature and this isn't just women um it, you know it's it's just all all beings are cyclical you know we have a circadian rhythm which kind of wakes us up the sleep wake cycle our cells have a cyclical rhythm we are cyclical beings and our body just it was expecting that and so it's been experiencing cyclical symptoms month after month year after year it carries on experiencing them we need more research in this area but i suppose i liken it a little bit to um people who've got you know had an amputation but they they feel like they can still feel their phantom limb it may not be exactly the same but i wonder if there's something like that going on um the brain's firing as though there's a stimulus there even though there isn't the good news is there are things that you can do about that. There's things like biofeedback and working on neuroplasticity of the brain, things like meditation, yoga, things like that. Um, accepting that we may have an exaggerated stress response because often the stress response was heightened when you were in the PMDD crisis and working on that. So that's really important and not to be underestimated and tends to get better in time. But I think most people do need to do some psychological work. Dietary and lifestyle measures um, are also really important and often I find this is not just for women with PMDD but with women who have um, you know, difficulties with menopause and they may be on HRT but still not feeling as well as they can. Having a routine, anything you can to create stability is really important. Stress reduction, hugely important in terms of moderating just, just overall the stress response but also affecting your immune system um and, and and kind of calming the nervous system meditation mindfulness something like creativity so the neuroplasticity of the brain things like i don't know just taking up drawing or reading novels things like that baking anything not focusing on those symptoms that can be really helpful gut health um is so important there's quite a lot of evidence now that a plant-based diet is is particularly beneficial for menopausal symptoms um, there's a number of reasons for that, not enough time to go into it, um, but um, affecting things like the, the, the health of the bacteria and the viruses and things that live in our gut, they can have an effect on how we deal with hormones, how we excrete hormones, whether or not we reabsorb parts of estrogen, which can um, affect levels of fluctuation, um, even how we deal, deal with HRT. Um, alcohol, again, is something which is really um, not, not particularly helpful in menopause or PMDD and can affect the gut health. And supplements can sometimes be helpful, especially vitamin D and some of the omega-3s and pro probiotics. Um, again, there's too much to go through um, with all of this, but all of these things that can be looked at and I think hopefully can um, give some people some positive hope that there, there, are, there, are, there are different reasons why these can help. Um, so. Uh, just briefly to mention, I helped with um, answer some of the questions on the IAPMD website. They've now got a surgical menopause resource, which is really good. Um, and there's articles on preparing for surgery for PMDD and PME and, and, and you know, what to expect afterwards, as well as a big bank of questions. And OK, um, I'm sorry, I've kind of overrun slightly, but I will now hand back to Alice. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Hannah. Thank you so much for that. That was absolutely fantastic. I really appreciate that uh, presentation. You went into so much detail. My mind was absolutely spinning. Uh, so, <laughs> so thank you so much. Um, we had so many questions come in. Um, I think we'll just be able to get through a, um, a handful of them. Um, I think one of the first things to, to maybe say is that I think one of the comments in the chat was surely that surgical menopause can't be as bad as PMDD. And I think um, from my perspective, it was a completely different experience to PMDD. And mm -hmm. I think that neuroplasticity that you talked about is, is really key. And, and I've had my surgery four years ago now, and I still notice that cycle mm -hmm. coming not every month but but you do notice it and um, but over time it certainly has got better but I think the key message with what you've been saying is that it is a, a unique experience to each individual and it's about finding your own equilibrium isn't it Definitely. I think um I don't want people to leave feeling kind of hopeless because I, I cause it, it, 
but, but I, I essentially I think menopause does provide some relief ultimately for women whether it's natural menopause or if it's surgical menopause I think it's just people need to understand that it doesn't take away that underlying hormone sensitivity um, whereas I naively thought myself seven years ago that having my ovaries out meant you know that I was everything was going to be hunky-dory and obviously it quite wasn't quite that simple um, and that we're still very susceptible to having um, you know the, the influences of, of hormonal change whether that's through HRT or anything else and obviously once we've had our ovaries removed um, they it's like a part of the orchestra has been removed in terms of the endocrine system and everything as you saw from that diagram earlier everything is so interconnected it's quite a crude treatment really in a way just giving back HRT it doesn't it doesn't really solve everything it can solve a lot of things it can make a lot of things better and obviously you've taken away the main driver um, I think it so yeah menopause can certainly ultimately menopause can help perimenopause can be just really rocky for people for the reasons we've said because it's just worsening and increasing the fluctuations unless it's the progesterone driving it in which case sometimes people can feel bizarrely better but it's just it comes down to everything is individual um but remembering that the hormonal sensitivity does not go away um it can be moderated and i think the neuroplasticity thing is something we need to do a lot more research in so yeah, absolutely. I think it, it's really interesting what's coming out in the literature about it. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. let's dive into some of the questions then. We've got a question from Emma. She asked, is there an optimal oestrogen level that we should be aiming for? No. <laughs> <laughs> it, well, this it, it really depends, to be honest. In younger women, we're mainly concerned about bone health in terms of, of optimum oestrogen levels and it depends if you're looking at something called bone sparing so you don't want to lose any bone or bone building if you're a younger woman and you've got something like osteopenia so your bones are a little bit on the thin side um, and most women who have um, POI or an early menopause should have a DEXA scan this doesn't always seems to happen to look at your bone health then you need a slightly higher level so I think we look at something like a level of 350 picomol per litre um, for bone building. It, if it's over 200, then that's, that should be okay in terms of bone sparing. Um, so essentially it's more how you, you know, the, what you feel well on is the main thing. But if you're under 45 and you have got signs of osteopenia or osteoporosis, you probably want a slightly higher level. Um, but it, it becomes a bit difficult. You can get quite obsessed with looking at levels. <laughs> Um, and it's not quite as back. And I, and I think I did that myself for years. Um, and some of some of us need much higher levels. I think I need a relatively high stable level, but the key is stable as well. And, and I think that that's the elusive thing a lot of the time. Yeah. Um, and it's realizing what other things have a massive impact. So for, I can't really drink alcohol. I mean, it's just not, it's not like a big deal, but it's kind of disappointing sometimes. And I know there's a lot of health benefits not drinking alcohol. So I, in a way, I suppose it's helped my health in other ways. But having a glass of wine can make me feel horrendous the next day. Um, yeah. And I see that in women who are naturally menopausal, who have no PMDD, but it tends to exacerbate stuff in PMDD. And I used to think, oh, my HRT is not right, this and that. So I just can't drink alcohol, <laughs> basically. So. so is there any danger of having a high dose oestrogen post-surgery? Again, it depends on your age. I think if you're... If your level and um, if, if your estrogen is too high, and again that can be a can subject as well, but you tend to have symptoms. If you've got, you know, constant breast tenderness or headaches or bloating or water retention, it might be that your level is too high. And uh, as with all HRT, whether you're menopausal with no PMDD or menopausal with PMDD, you just need to have. Um, you know, you, you, we were supposed to give you an ad, the lowest dose, but it needs to be the lowest effective dose. So that doesn't necessarily mean a lowest dose. It's the lowest dose that's effective for you. This is when it all comes to about being very subjective, really. Mm -hmm. And women also absorb differently from HRT. So every, people can have the same dose patch and they will have different blood levels. It's all, it's very, it can be quite confusing um, and quite difficult to manage. Um, but essentially, it's more important is how you feel. Um, but that's why you might need regular review until you can get a dose that's right for you. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I certainly noticed that. <laughs> I, I think that's one of the um, the benefits of having um, the Easter gel, where you can titrate it um, as well, sort of on a day-to-day -day basis based on how you feel, which can be quite useful. 
Um, somebody leading on from that um, was asking, uh, there we go, Vanessa. She was asking, how can we optimize our estrogen absorption? It depends on what you're using, I suppose, for if it's a gel or if it's a patch. Um, so if you're using a gel, in, um, it, again, it, de it depends on the manufacturers and what we know, so what, which product you're using, but say Estrogel, for example, the um, manufacturers will recommend that you spread that and um, or use it on the thigh, so it can really depend on where you're applying it. You need to generally apply estrogen where there's some subcutaneous fat. So for, not that anybody would, but you wouldn't want to put it on the top of your chest, for example, because most of us don't have a lot of fat there, but a lot of us will have subcutaneous fat in our thighs and it builds up in a reservoir under the skin. You don't want to spread it over too um, high an area, so they will say spread it over two palms widths. Um, and let it dry um, and you should generally try and apply it around the same place or at least alternate or alternate thighs um, occasionally you see that, that situations where people it seems as though the, the estrogen receptors have been saturated in which case you can just change it to a di the, you know different the separate thigh to do that making sure it's completely dry for when you um, when you put it on, um, I mean, I, some people will say they put it on all over the place. It, no, you need, you need to be able to build up um, just a reservoir under the skin around the same place. Right. If, it's a, if it's a patch, you're not going to be absorbing it very well if you're somebody who's irritated by the patch. So some, I, one person who will get irritated, I can't tolerate the patches. If your skin is inflamed, you're not going to absorb it well. There's a new spray called Lenzetto, which is relatively low dose, but might work well for some people. That, for example, it, in, it's designed to be absorbed actually here in, in the inside of the arm. Mm -hmm. um, and but you can also apply it on your thigh. But if you apply it on your tummy, it doesn't seem to be absorbed as well. So it can be very product dependent. So. Very interesting. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure a lot of us have been taking notes <laughs> on that question. Um, I wanted to touch a little bit on progesterone if that's okay. Um, Rachel has asked if um, we know how long it takes for progesterone to leave our system after we've had a surgical hysterectomy. Well it'd be pretty quickly but bearing in mind the your adrenal glands also produce small amounts of progesterone so we'll never completely get rid of progesterone but that doesn't seem to be a problem for most people so the progesterone will drop pretty quickly and much like if you when you've had a period um and then that's often to do with the abrupt withdrawal of, of progesterone um when an egg isn't fertilized then 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 you're kind of progesterone free or min you've got minimal progesterone so it won't take it won't take very long at all be a matter of days if, if that really um having said that you you're not going to have high you know you are going to have small amounts of progesterone because our adrenal glands produce small amounts it's that you know our adrenal glands pr um, produce precursors to testosterone and estrogen and progesterone um, fat cells produce estrogen and stuff as well so it's not just the ovaries that provide the, the hormones but they're the main source uh, one thing I realized I forgot to mention was testosterone which is very can be very important for women with surgical menopause um, and especially the libido yeah so libido but it can also be hugely important in terms of it can uh, with headache with mood with muscle strength with bone health but not everybody will need it and it's generally only considered if you know you still have symptoms and you have what we consider an adequate dose of estrogen but it's often a lot of women in early menopause or surgical menopause will need it and it can be helpful for mood as well and, and yeah libido and energy Oh, that's really interesting. Um, because somebody has said that they struggle with their libido since their surgical uh, menopause and wondered if that was um, anything to do with their estrogen level or if anything else can be done for it. Certainly it's to do with est yeah, estrogen. Um, essentially, it's, it's female castration, essentially, isn't it? If you have your ovaries taken out and they, you know, used to castrate men if they felt they had too high a sex drive or whatever. So, yeah, it's certainly that you've there's certainly there's a hormonal element and that can be problematic. Um, and that's when having an adequate estrogen and testosterone level can be helpful. But often that with libido is complex and there's psychological work to do there as well. A lot of women who've had reproductive um, surgery might kind of be very ha have, a, have an issue with dealing with anything to do with that part of their body and therefore sometimes even just switch off from wanting sex. But and then that's maybe when psychological work is more important or it could be 
to do with dryness or pain with intercourse or sex, in which case they might need vaginal oestrogen and lubricants. So yes, that's a very good book. Hang on, I'm just going to get it to tell people to get this book here. <laughs> It's going to be backwards, but me and my menopausal vagina <laughs> by Jane Lewis. <laughs> okay. Okay. Amazing. Thank you. That'll be sold out by the end of the day. <laughs> uh, that, that is actually um, a question that I wanted to move on to next because that is something that that we don't really talk about vaginal dryness, and it's it it's something that we we think we need to suffer with and stay silent for, and. Um, I have had a question from somebody who wanted to stay anonymous about it, saying that it's been waking them up from sleep. Um, they're worried they're developing vaginal atrophy. You know, it, it's something that is one of the biggest concerns for them at the moment. And they've been prescribed um, Vagifem for twice a week, but they're not sure if there are any other um, options that they can ask for or if there are any natural supplements they can take. So, yeah, but not every, again, as with the case with all hormones, not every woman is the same, but a lot of women will have vaginal dryness. Sometimes it's not enough to bother them and they may only notice it if they have penetrative sex, in which case a lubricant can help. But I think if any woman has any symptoms of dryness, um, and dryness is just, we say it's a term we bandy around, but actually you can get burning, you can get irritation, it can feel inflamed, it can feel sore. You can get bladder irritation and, and, and it, a feeling of stinging when you're going for a wee. It might feel like you have a urine infection, but then you have a check and there will be no infection or it can increase the risk of infections. And it's all to do with the lack of estrogen, which is a natural lubricant and also provides um, the lubricant that you naturally produce with estrogen also prevents um, or has an acts as a barrier, um, can reduce the introduction of bacteria into the urethra and the bladder and reduces the risk of cystitis. So all of these things are connected. It can be one of the, it, it, it's easy to help on one hand, but can take quite a long time to respond. And that's why if anybody's having symptoms, they should have treatment sooner rather than later. So Vagifem is, is going to be helpful, but it's often not given in a high enough dose. So it's their 10 microgram pessaries. And you normally would start with a build-up course of one every two weeks, and then you go down to twice a week. The problem is that isn't enough for about 50% of women who have symptoms. Um, really? And the dose used to be 25 micrograms and now it's 10 micrograms. Um, so some women will need to use it every day or alternate days. But not for every woman, it's not always the right, it's not necessarily the right thing for them. Some people are sensitive to the ingredients. Um, there is, there's something called ovesting cream, which can be a bit more soothing. So if you're particularly dry, um, you insert that into the vagina in much the same way. Um, and also it's got estriol as opposed to estradiol, so a different form of estrogen. And there's more estriol receptors um, in the vagina than there are estradiol receptors. Um, there's, some, there's intrarosa, which is a DHEA pessary, which has been licensed in this country for um, pain with sex, but it can just help with the atrophy as well. And it's precursors to estrogen and testosterone. There's a silicon ring with estrogen. There's lots of things that can help. There's also sea buckthorn oil as a natural supplement, which can help with vaginal dryness. And you can take that alongside um, HRT and using a good lubricant, so something like Yes or Silk, avoid KY jelly because it can irritate everything. Um, but a lot of women will end up needing HR, like a systemic HRT and um, estrogen HRT. Um, but I urge you to get that book, Me and My Menopause Vagina by Jane Lewis, because she's a lady who's really struggled with symptoms and has just bravely talked about her story. Um, and yeah, she, she does lots of, I think she does a lot of stuff on Instagram and I'm not on Instagram, but I know she's very active on Instagram, but she's right. also on Twitter and Facebook, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, so talking about HRT again, um, Rebecca has asked what, her, what are the potential options for HRT if there is a history, a family history of stroke and whether oestrogen has a relationship with that. So this is why quite a lot of the scare mongering came with, with some of the, the, the HRT kind of things. With, with a tablet form of oestrogen, there is an increased risk of, of, of blood clots. Um, and, so you really want to be avoiding that. Um, if you have a transdermal form of oestrogen, so a spray or a patch or a gel, then there's no increased risk of blood clots and there's, it's a much lower risk of stroke if you're going to have that. So 
in the recent studies, there hasn't really been shown to be an association with, with the stroke, um, if with the estrogen only, if it's transdermal, it's, it's more the tablet form. But if you need to take progesterone as well, that, that can be important. So some of the progestogens are more likely to increase your risk of blood clot than others. So a marina is, is a lower risk, but the natural progesterone, um, eutrogestin again, is, is, is one of the lowest risks. So it's working to have something that would be the lowest risk, which essentially is a transdermal estrogen, natural progesterone or marina. Okay, thank so. you. Um, which leads me on to a question from Melanie, who's asked, is there any evidence that using subdermal pellets are better than topical HRT for patients with PMDD? No, I don't think there's any evidence for that. I personally do use them, but that's purely because um, I don't seem to be able to absorb it via my skin. <laughs> um, and I think there, they can be problems with, with, with implants, which is something that I do still struggle with, um, in that when, when an implant or a pellet is put in, it, you, you have a high rise quickly, it goes up like that. And then you'll have a couple of months or so when it's stable like that, and then it goes down like this. Yeah. And so to be honest, every time it goes in and then every time it falls out, you can feel pretty rotten again. Um, and there, there, there can be problems in that if you have estrogen and testosterone, they can be used used up quick, more quickly than on the other. So they're not an easy option and they're normally a last resort if you're unable to take estrogen in other ways. If I could take it in another way, I would do. They're also very hard to get hold of. So the N most NHS places don't offer it now. Um, and they're expensive privately but and hard to get hold of privately because we did, they're not licensed in the UK. Um, so they are available but they're hard to come by um, and they're not an easy option, unfortunately. Um, yeah. Um, okay, so just a couple more questions if you've got time, Hannah. Um, <laughs> we've had a question from um, Peter Greenhouse. Mm -hmm. He commented to say thank you very much for an excellent presentation um, and that he has seen many women with obvious perimenopause in their early 30s. So recent onset of significant exacerbation of pre-existing PMS plus classical physical symptoms and was wondering what your thoughts are on this. I guess it becomes quite hard to to know what's perimenopausal, what is PME, what's PME, especially if you're still having regular cycles because some of the the some, some of the symptoms of PMDD or PME can be similar to perimenopausal and especially if there's an element I mentioned on the, the histamine intolerance can cause it can cause perimenopausal type symptoms. Um, and so I think it's really hard to kind of tease apart what's going on sometimes. I said you want to make sure that these women aren't in an early menopause. And I'm sure Peter will know, you know, obviously know about doing the blood tests four to six weeks apart, but to know that you're not obviously kind of developing POI. Um, but I suppose it is then about tracking. I think I'm always asking people to track whether there is, if there's anything diet, dietary lifestyle related that might provide a clue if there's a histamine intolerance, I suppose, um, or if it has it been triggered by any, any, anything else. Often people find that their symptoms worsen after the birth of a child or if they've changed contraception. Um, I, yeah, I don't really, I think it's an area we just need a lot more research in, to be honest. <laughs> Yeah, I think so. Women's health is notoriously under-researched, I think. But I, I mean, I think, and I, and I don't know if it is that we have just missed a lot of stuff. So in theory, you can, obviously, perimenopausal symptoms can start up to 10 years before. You could be, therefore, if you're naturally going to be menopausal at 45, you could start perimenopausal symptoms at 35, but it's not something we automatically think of. But it wouldn't necessarily be unreasonable. Um, and if you're in just a slightly earlier menopause, say 43, 44, then that would be in your early 30s so I suppose the follow-up question from that has come from Rebecca who asks what are the tests for knowing you are in perimenopause that a GP could do for you or should you be under a specialist who can tailor this okay so this is probably not the answer people want but there's no there's no tests essentially um it's it, PMDD for, um, I know you should ask about perimenopause. PMDD is, is not a hormonal imbalance. It's, it's an abnormal reaction to hormonal fluctuations. So your hormones may well be normal. 
in perimenopause, the guidance is that there's, there's, there's no point doing blood tests because your levels are all over the shop. So you kind of saw from the basic diagram earlier that um, your estrogen levels are everywhere. They're not really going to, they're not going to affect management. The only way we, when we do them is to rule out other things. If you're under 45, you might want to check your FSH levels to make sure you're not developing an early menopause. Um, and they need to be consistently high but over four to six weeks. Um, or sometimes thyroid disorder can sometimes have similar symptoms. So th th thyroid disorder, again, because it's another hormonal thing, can affect your brain health. Um, so you, it's sometimes worth checking that. Um, in terms of histamine intolerance, there again, there are some blood tests, but they're normally done by private practitioners, and it's not something that's routinely done. There's a lady called Tina Pierce who does has a special interest in that. If people want, to, I mean, that's what, what she she's a sexual reproductive health doctor, but she does a lot to do with histamine intolerance, so she might be somebody worth asking. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I one of the questions that has come through about histamine intolerance. Um, has come from um, one of the examples is Stacey Marie. Hi Stacey, I know you were at conference last year. Um, have you helped a PMDD sufferer overcome PMDD with histamine intolerance? And if so, what were the key helping points? I think the thing, the thing is like I was saying, these are chronic conditions and I'm, I am not an expert in histamine intolerance, to be honest. So I, I have... I've seen big changes in people with both perimenopause without a history of PMDD, but potential histamine intolerance, and those with PMDD and possible histamine intolerance. Cutting out dairy is a big thing, um, and that, that can make a massive difference in alcohol, but cutting out fermented foods that you might traditionally think of as otherwise quite helpful, so things like sauerkraut, kimchi, kefir, stuff that, we, that are helpful for gut health, aren't necessarily helpful if you've got histamine intolerance and it might just I don't know enough about it to know that if it's a short-term thing that if things balance out you could then reintroduce things again um, but certainly it, and, and also it's a degree of scale so it does there's hist we now you can't get rid of histamine we produce it naturally our mast cells produce it it's in foods um, it's more it, it's more of a dose dependent thing but we know say out cutting out alcohol dairy um, processed meats, smoked meats, fishes, things like that, and, and some fermented foods and things like avocado, bizarrely, um, are high in histamine. So there are there are websites that kind of can give you more details than that. But often I just say cut it, cutting out the kind of highly processed or fer fermented foods. Um, yes, yeah, smoked meats, fish, dairy, alcohol, <laughs> antihistamines. And you can take the, you know, things like cetirizine or loratadine over the counter. You can take those twice daily. They say once daily, but... Um, Does oestrogen treatment them. seem to have an impact? I'm sorry. Does oestrogen treatment seem to have an impact it, on on histamine? Mm. Yeah. So sometimes it can work. This is when there can be the problem when people feel that they can't tolerate oestrogen. It's more to do with the histamine, and then that's when right you maybe make some some lifestyle changes and increase oestrogen slowly and potentially take it alongside an antihistamine until your body's used to a new dose. Sometimes that can help. So I have had success in really, really having a tiny, tiny doses of oestrogen and building up really slowly and somebody who thought she couldn't tolerate it at all. Right. Wonderful. That sounds really exciting. But it's just, it's, it's so individual, it's impossible to give a generic answer, I think. <laughs> so. It really is, as is the case with most of these uh, topics. Um, lastly then, um, I've got a, a question from Ebony. Um, who's asked, is there a menopause treatment pathway for people who have had oestrogen induced mania with their PMDD? And not that I know of. Oestrogen. I have no, I, not, not that I know of. I don't think, I mean, the, if, the, it's such a new area, unfortunately. Um, I think most of the work, the, the exciting work, the best place to go is the IAPMD.org website. Um, and they, and hope that there's then there's, there's, they've published quite a lot of the evidence on there for various treatments, but I think it's something that we need to do because I think much like people saying we shouldn't be giving any SSRIs in menopause, which is not helpful advice across the board because actually it can work in conjunction and sometimes it, it's what women need. Mm -hmm. um, um, it, it's it, it, we can't say every woman has progesterone intolerance who has PMDD, and we can't say that oestrogen is the answer for everybody. All I can say is that oestrogen is very important if you're in early menopause for your health and it's trying to work out how you can, you know, moderate that um, if, you, if, you, if it's also exacerbating things. 
with everything so all things like endometriosis things like migraine are similar to pmdd in that any if you have sharp rises in in, in estrogen they can trigger symptoms so often it's just about doing make, making any changes slowly and in small increments so thank you so much um the last question that i have from me mm -hmm. is what is your key take-home message from today's webinar that you'd like our participants to take away <laughs> it's going to be quite a long one probably but uh, men menopause it can be challenging for women whether or not they have PMDD okay uh, it's been that's been under recognized and it's not managed particularly well even now in the medical community but things are getting better because the challenges of menopause are often to do with hormonal fluctuations and the hormonal deficiency and um, that just exacerbates the problems with PMDD for a lot of women but there is hope I think at the other side because once you're without your natural cycle things will be easier to manage and whether that's a surgical menopause or a natural menopause. I think people might feel a bit hopeless, like there is no you know, easy answer, but I think it, I feel better now than I did before my surgery, but it's not been easy. And I don't want people to think surgical menopause is an easy answer because it isn't. And I wish, I really wish that I didn't have to have my, my ovaries removed at 35, to be honest, because surgical menopause ha has ongoing issues for me and for many others. Um, I am in a better place. It's just, it, it, it is recognising that it's a chronic condition. I think hormone sensitivity is a chronic condition. Surgical menopause is a chronic condition. And that, that things that you do on a day-to-day -day basis have an impact. Um, I think that's the thing, that there are things you can do. HRT and hormone therapy is likely to be part of the management for everybody to some degree. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's just individually working out and, and the things that you can you can do stuff to make a difference. So for me, making lifestyle changes has been a huge process. So exercising my diet, things like that have made a massive impact. So thank you. Okay. Um, if people wanted to um, have a consultation with you, do you um, are you available internationally as well as within the UK? Unfortunately, not internationally because we're not the insurance won't doesn't cover it because they you have to be registered as a doctor in that country um unfortunately so people so sadly not internationally but um yes nationally i and i'm doing online consults at the moment because of covid so <laughs> okay that's fantastic thank you and your website is drhannashort.co.uk yes that's right yeah. lovely thank you so much hannah for for giving thank your you. time really really appreciate it. it's been so thought-provoking thank you okay thanks very much Alice okay thanks then bye bye, bye. bye. I'll do I can't you're still here that's fine <laughs> I'll stay here. I can't. Um, so Thank you everybody. That draws our webinar to a close today. Um, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. The chat was, was really interesting, really engaging and some fantastic questions were asked. So thank you so much. Um, I'm sure we've all got our own take home message today. I know that from my perspective, I need to start to consider my surgical menopause as that chronic condition and start to become the expert patient in that and establish my new normal and continue to work on my mental health because that neuroplasticity element was so interesting. And I think that is an area that I'm, I'm definitely going to explore in more detail. Like I said, for more information about Hannah and booking a consult consultation with her, you can find all of the information on her website at um, drhannahshort.co.uk. She's also on Twitter at Dr. Hannah Short. Um, the, a couple of other bits of information I want to give you before we close the meeting today is that as Hannah touched upon, there is a brand new section of the IAPMD website, which explores a wealth of information and resources to do with surgical menopause. And you can find all of that at iapmd.org. 
I hope you'll join us for our next webinar in our series of PMDD and Me Meets the Professionals. Uh, it will be on the 18th of July and it is with Dr. Mandy Leonhart. She is also a specialist GP and she runs a clinic in Hampshire. She specializes in the holistic assessment and individualized care of women with hormonal imbalances at any stage of their life. And she's going to be presenting on the impact of nutrition and hormonal balance. So that's sure to be um, another fantastic webinar. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank our sponsors, Asarina Pharma. They are a pharmacological company that have been developing the innovative drug Sopranolone, which is showing hugely promising results for menstrual migraines as well as Tourette's syndrome. So if you want to find out more information about them or get involved in their trials, you can go to asarinapharma.com. We're going to leave the chat function open now for another five minutes uh, before we close the webinar so that you can continue talking to each other. Um, but once again, thank you so much for joining us here today. It's been really fantastic. And I hope that we will see you again at our next webinar as PMDD and me meets the professionals. Thank you. Goodbye.